Hello, everybody. I'm Joe Lombardo. I'm the coordinator of the United National Anti-War Coalition. And we are continuing with our series of interviews with members of our administrative committee. And today we're talking with Rhonda Romero, who is the chair of Bayan USA, which is a coalition of a number of Filipino groups in the United States. She is also a member of the UNAC Administrative Committee and on the International Coordinating Committee of the ILPS, which is the International League of People's Struggle. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the Philippines and the U.S. pivot to Asia. So um, welcome, Rhonda. Hi, Joe. So, Rhonda, I understand that um, recently there was an announcement that Duterte, the president of the Philippines, um, is suspending the plans or terminating the plans uh, for the visiting forces agreement between the Philippines and the U.S. Um, could you explain what the visiting forces agreement is? Sure. So the, this is really big and important news for um, the Filipino people and to all people who are concerned with U.S. militarism and um, the military buildup, particularly in Asia. Um, so the Visiting Forces Agreement was a military agreement between the United States and the Philippines set up in 1999, um, a few years after the Filipino people uh, rose up and uh, launched a movement to uh, terminate the presence of U.S. bases. In the Philippines. Um, the Philippines had been home to the largest uh, overseas bases uh, in the world of the United States and so it was uh, it took a huge movement um, to uh, terminate what was then the U.S. Philippines um, uh, military bases agreement. Um, but year, a few years after that in 1999 uh, that agreement was replaced with the visiting forces agreement. Um, it was an arrangement uh, for allowing the U.S. to be able to enter and exit um, the Philippines, use the Philippines um, as uh, a place where they could base troops, base ships, base war material uh, without actually having to have formal um, uh, U.S. bases uh, on the land, uh, at least not formally, because that would actually violate the Constitution. Um, it was a very tricky type of arrangement. It allowed for the U.S. to be able to use uh, Philippine facilities, Philippine bases, and really um, even um, civilian like airports and seaports for um, U.S. troops um, to be able to station uh, what they called on a temporary or, or rotational basis uh, in order to get around the laws of uh, foreign military being on Philippine soil. Um, and so it was uh, kind of a, 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 a landmark agreement uh, in terms of U.S. Um, military strategy, um, being able to skirt around uh, a country's um, constitution and laws, banning foreign troops from being on the soil, um, and therefore allowing troops to come in under the guise of like they're visiting or they're rotating through. Um, what ended up happening uh, after that was the U.S. was able to bring in troops um, and uh, ships and, you know, planes and drones and uh, even, um, you know, armaments uh, under this agreement uh, in violation of the Constitution. Um, troops would stay for years uh, even though they were supposedly only there on a visiting basis or a rotational basis. Um, the uh, result was um, U.S. Uh, military um, forces, you know, sometimes 600 to several thousand at a time, uh, being in places uh, which were also um, hotbeds of uh, resistance against uh, U.S. Um, uh, occupation, U.S. Uh, uh, corporations coming in and kind of stealing um, taking over land that was once indigenous land, um, uh, places where um, you actually had, you know, a strong um, opposition to um, uh, the, you know, status quo, per se. Um, 
So it was uh, an agreement that really provided that legal framework for the troops to be able to be in the country. Um, it also allowed for uh, these joint military exercises and training between the US and the Philippine military. Um, and there would be thousands like literally thousands of troops um, conducting these exercises uh, in villages, in communities where people lived. And you had, of course, uh, in the aftermath, uh, people being caught in the crossfire sometimes of these games, um, abuse of children and women in the communities, uh, and so forth. Um, one other, you know, kind of important thing about the visiting forces agreement that I want to mention um, is that it also governed um, the actions of um, U.S. troops that are in the Philippines. And so if um, military personnel of the U.S. were um, uh, violating any laws of the Philippines, they could not be um, charged under Philippine law. They would still be under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Um, so there were um, several high-profile cases mm -hmm. uh, of rape and even murder of uh, Filipinos um, that uh, by um, U.S. military personnel who then were protected from uh, prosecution under Philippine law uh, and were um, then um, kind of safeguarded and shielded by the U.S. military. Um, and so th that was, you know, definitely something that has caused uh, a lot of um, not only concern but outrage among the Filipino people. Um, so the Visiting Forces Agreement has been in place since 1999 to allow for this type of um, U.S. presence in the country um, and, you know, in some ways really intervention in the affairs of the Philippines. Uh, you can imagine if you are, you know, say um, a, a, a peasant organizer or organizing uh, Filipino um, uh, farm workers uh, in areas where there are these military exercises happening. Um, it's very intimidating, right? It's a, a, a tactic of intimidation um, to prevent any kind of continued organizing if you have thousands of uh, Philippine and U.S. troops uh, around the area uh, where people are trying to organize. Um, so um, that's, you know, kind of the situation with uh, the VFA. Now, in uh, February of this year, Duterte actually um, said that he was taking moves to suspend the Visiting Forces Agreement. Uh, and um, it, there was a, a time period of six months um, in which um, either side, the U.S. or the Philippines, could try and take action to um, stop the suspension. Um, the Filipino people, you know, were, have been campaigning for the continuing suspension of the VFA um, since that time. Um, but in a pretty dramatic uh, reversal earlier this week, um, Duterte uh, announced that he was was um, uh, suspending his plans to terminate the VFA. Um, it kind of, it comes on the heels of uh, a big two billion dollar U.S. arms deal with the Philippines. It also happens at a time when there's the pandemic um, and, you know, widespread repression against um, people who are um, speaking out against the um, uh, very heavy-handed um, curfews and what's called enhanced community quarantine, virtual martial law in much of the country. Um, so we really see this as a tactic of Duterte mm -hmm. to um, get on the good side of the U.S. again and to be able to um, continue uh, with allowing U.S. Uh, military in the country under this agreement. Didn't uh, the U.S forces actually play a role with the Philippine military in suppressing some of the rebellion that's happening, especially in Mindanao and the southern part of the Philippines. They've, they um, characterize some of those people as ISIS and use that as the justification for playing a role. Is that true? Yes, yes. Um, you know, really it started in, in 2001 after the Philippines was declared the second front in the war on terror. Uh, that's when you actually, we actually saw an um, uh, influx of U.S. troops being stationed in, um, in, in Mindanao in the south under the guise of fighting terror. Uh, most recently in 2017, there was um, supposed 
ISIS uh, leaders, uh, Southeast Asian leaders of ISIS uh, in Mindanao. Uh, and that was the excuse that the Philippine military used to, uh, to invade uh, the city of Marawi, which is in the south, home to 400,000 people. And then with um, uh, support uh, of the U.S. through surveillance, through drones, uh, equipment, training, went in and really just flattened the city um, to the ground. I mean, really uh, leveled it and drove 400,000 people um, into refugee camps because of this um, uh, kind of military uh, operation. Um, now, that was uh, largely seen as an excuse, um, you know, using the excuse of ISIS to go in and destroy a city um, which was uh, home to, you know, a majority uh, Muslim population. Um, also, um, in a very key location in the country, um, part of that city um, has now been designated as a military reserve. Um, so now you clear out all the people and um, have an excuse to be able to use um, that land for military um, you know, bases and for a, a base of operations for the Philippine military. Mm -hmm. So do you think there'll be an opposition in the Philippines, even given the, um, uh, the pandemic that's going against uh, this decision on the part of Duterte? Yes. Um, so even, you know, back in 1999, when this agreement was first signed, there were immediate challenges um, in the street and in, um, uh, you know, legislative venues, uh, even a Supreme Court challenge to the constitutionality of it. Um, but every time there are military exercises, you know, this is like the most uh, uh, like uh, blatant, you know, um, show of force when thousands of the troops come together, there are always uh, demonstrations uh, conducted by the people to oppose these exercises. Um, and we see now that even with the um, curfews and the very strict um, uh, community quarantine measures which are being taken, the people are still going out and protesting. You know, I think as long as there is this um, repression and but there are no actual um, uh, um, there's no actual real change to the conditions of poverty and um, injustice, then the people are going to continue to rise up. Um, and so we are seeing that already. Some of it is through um, creative means, you know, online and social media. Um, but um, I think we can expect um, protests in the streets as well. Great. Why is the Philippines so important to the United States? And how does it relate to this so-called uh, pivot to Asia that the U.S. is trying to do uh, right now. Do you have any thoughts on that? Right, yeah. The Philippines has always been key to um, U.S. strategy in the Asia-Pacific region. It's in a very strategic, you know, uh, location geopolitically, um, right there, not far from um, China, uh, along these different um, waterways and the straits, uh, where you know, like a third of um, commerce throughout the world is actually shipped. So there's really important um, uh, economic reasons for the U.S. to um, want to have uh, its troop presence, um, its military presence in the Philippines. Uh, and then now, after the 2011, you know, announcement of the U.S. Uh, pivot to Asia, which was the announcement made, um, you know, that was, you know, Hillary Clinton's time as uh, Secretary of State, you know, announcing that um, the U.S. would shift more of its military from where it currently was, Middle East, to parts of Asia. Um, Trump has very clearly articulated his uh, uh, and his factions, you know, like opposition to China has been um, really ratcheting up the kind of warmongering type of language against China uh, and the Philippines being located geographically where we are um, is key to having um, a, a place where the U.S. has a reliable um, puppet government which will allow troops to be deployed. Um, and, you know, it's part of their, like, what they call their forward um, presence uh, for power projection in, in Asia. Uh, and so the U.S. 
needs and wants to, to maintain the Philippines as that uh, kind of loyal and reliable um, physical base for uh, its troop deployment in, in the Asia Pacific. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Trump seems to like Duterte a lot. They seem to be cut from the same cloth. But as you mentioned, it was under Hillary Clinton that this whole pivot to Asia doesn't really matter if it's Democrat or Republican. U.S. imperialism seems to uh, to continue. Um, uh, so, um, before we end, um, uh, Rhonda, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to just mention about the situation in the Philippines or the pivot to Asia? Yes. Um, yeah. Just kind of picking up on that last uh, uh, comment that you made, Joe. I think the um, the increasing fascism of the Duterte regime um, is something that all of us should be alarmed about. You know, the tactics that Duterte employed on, in his so-called war on drugs, um, targeting um, just the masses of, you know, poor and working people um, for outright, you know, assassination and to really sow terror among the people. Um, is something that all of us um, should be looking at and uh, see as uh, something to be combated. You know, we don't want this to continue to spread to other countries. We, we hear other strong arm, um, you know, would be dictators using the same kind of tough language. Um, and it's, you know, really leading to um, this increase in fascist oppression. Um, Duterte, after that war on drugs uh, pronouncements, you know, went on to then use the same tactics against um, activists, organizers. And um, no matter who you were, it didn't matter if you were a student activist, um, uh, a priest, um, even, um, you, know, uh, you know, mothers in the street, farmers, um, organizing, he used the same tactics, labeling people as drug users or as terrorists to um, justify their assassination. Um, you know, the language that Duterte, I mean, um, Trump has been using over the past few days, you know, labeling protesters as terrorists and um, saying that they should be shot, you know, it sounds like something um, Duterte you know, has been saying. Um, there's a new anti-terror bill, which um, uh, both houses of Congress in the Philippines has just passed. And it the provisions of it are so broad that anybody could really be labeled um, a terrorist. You know, you and I talking about war could be <laughs> labeled as an act of terrorism, anything that criticizes the government. And um, Duterte is expected to sign it and it could become law um, at the beginning of July. Um, and so that's another thing that we're also um, campaigning against and I think can be considered, um, you know, part of this whole war on terror since after 2001 and its connections to, um, you know, the U.S. war machine are very clear. Uh, we all, you know, and as UNAC, I think we have a, a huge role to play in being able to, um, you know, expose these kind of connections and campaign against uh, the U.S. wars against the people, whether they're proxy wars or, um, you know, the war on terror, which has, um, you know, been now spread to other countries in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the U.S. anti-war movement has to spend more time talking about and thinking about this pivot to Asia, what's going on in the Philippines, because I think this will be the next big theater that the U.S. military will be involved in and seems to be the biggest buildup of the U.S. military and the U.S. Navy at this point and uh, I think it's only going to continue. Well thanks Rhonda, it was great to talk to you and um, um, I'll talk to you again soon. Take care. Great. Goodbye. Thanks Joe.